All right, I'm gonna do that again. So, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the uh, BEG Technical uh, Seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Fleck. Uh, Pete is a research scientist with the State of Texas Advanced Resource Recovery Program, and he is what I describe as a core hard, uh, uh, hardcore uh, stratigrapher and uh, sedimentologist. He got his uh, bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Wisconsin his PhD from the University of uh, Alaska. He's also a professional photographer, which is quite useful to have, uh, you know, especially in the field. And Pete has seen and described a lot of rocks uh, over the years. You know, uh, he has done extensive work on the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway uh, with work uh, in uh, Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming. Uh, but he has also uh, ventured uh, to extreme environments up north and uh, the north slope of Alaska. And he has also done work in Patagonia and Antarctica. So um, today, Pete will be talking about some work that he has been doing as part of a STAR uh, project. And he has been working on this for a number of years on the Wilcox Group. And I'm extremely excited uh, because he has some new uh, data uh, that is very um, promising on the PETM and stuff like that. So with that, Thank you. Thank you very much. It sounds like the mic is working, correct? Yes. Okay, good. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Lorena. Um, thanks, everybody, coming out here on a foggy morning. Um, so uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, the folks who are collaborating with me on this, because this is not all of my own work at all. So, um, you know, Bill Ambrose has uh, done a extensive work on the Wilcox and worked with us on a number of these projects. Chris Dennison from Astro Stratigraphics, who's here today, um, <clears throat> who's done some, some work on Biostrat, as well as Thomas Demchuk at Petrostrat, uh, who we're using for the Biostrat. And then uh, a hunk of the last two thirds of this is uh, Catherine Garcia's MS thesis, which is in progress. And that's one of the things I really want to point out today is that is that uh, a hug of this is a work in progress, right? And so I'm kind of giving you some preliminary data, um, especially in the last two thirds of this this talk. But uh, a lot of this data is work that that Catherine Garcia is doing and has done and is still doing. And we also like to thank um, Alan Chodowski at the Acme Brick Company in Elgin for letting us into the quarry, which um, you know can be a difficult thing to get. Um, just to really quickly, you know, this is part of the Star Wilcox Working Group work for Star, and uh, you know, Ulia's involved, Lorena's involved. There are a lot of people involved in this, and, and what we're trying to do is really increase our general understanding about the Wilcox Group pretty much everywhere, right? And try and provide multidisciplinary investigations, collaborations on the Wilcox Group group stratigraphy, um, you know, with, with all kinds of different uh, different methodologies to try and, and, and solve some of our problems about reservoirs, um, connectivity, and uh, age relationships. Um, you know, we need, we need these correlations to go from onshore to the deep water. It's very difficult to get across the growth fault domain. And so um, that's part of the, the reason why we're doing the, the, the biostratigraphy that we're doing and the isotope uh, work that we're doing. Uh, you know, we need to refine these regional correlations. Can we sort out and, and better understand the significance of the PETM, not only you know, to help us correlate um, uh, up and down uh, across the, the growth faults, but also just to, you know, as, as a, a response of sedimentological response to climate change. And that's very, very important. And can we, can we say something about that? And we have a bunch of collaborators who you can see here. I won't mention them, but um, there's a number of them. You know, we're doing high resolution bio and chronostratigraphy uh, based on core and wireline logs. We're doing geochemical studies. Uh, the geochemistry is proving to be very useful for the work that we're doing on the Wilcox. And I've used uh, geochemistry on other PETM successions, for example, in the Hanna Basin. Um, Porosity and permeability studies, CO2 sequestration. I mean, Wil the Wilcox is being evaluated for CO2 sequestration. And even if we're not sequestering it at these particular locations I'm going to talk about, they can serve as analogs for these um, these reservoirs uh, in other areas. Um, and then architectural analyses, stratigraphic analyses, sedimentology, and just better understanding the deltaic shorelines of the Paleocene 
Lower Wilcox. So today I'm going to talk about three things. I hope I can get through it. I think I can get through it. Okay. Um, it's first of all, I'm going to show you outcrop evidence for this variable channel floodplain facies and straddle architectures across the Simsboro to Calvert Bluff transition, which are in the Wilcox group at this Acme Brick Company quarry in Butler, Texas. Uh, and that's being published in GCAGS journal this year, I hope. Um, and then we're gonna go and look at some things that Catherine Garcia is working on for MS, which is the Wilcox group to Carrizo Claiborne group transition in the outcrops in Bastra that contain the uh, PETM. Uh, and uh, and then also the Calvert Bluff to Carrizo and Reclaw transition in the subsurface in Anderson County that's related because it's it's the same interval essentially, okay? Or we thought, so I'll get to that. So the takeaway points, the Rocox remains important for many reasons, reservoirs, aquifers, reservoir model modeling and sequestration. Um, Outcrops of the Wilcox are extremely important, and we should keep re-examining them. We have new techniques all the time to, to, to better understand outcrops, and they're there. It, hopefully, they're still there, and we should really examine them continuously and think of new ways that we can examine these outcrops. Um, just drone photogrammetry in general and high-resolution imagery is becoming increasingly important as technologies improve and analysis to, tools improve and software improves. I mean, you can now do some analysis on outcrop and take a 3D model of an outcrop to the field with you and potentially look at the interpretations of someone who you know, had a 3D model of this outcrop made in the lab. And so that's huge. It's huge for teaching, field courses, um, just everything, even interpretation in a, on an outcrop. Um, I'm not gonna explain those technologies today, but I can talk about them. Um, archiving these 3D models is extremely important. I've been having lots of conversations with the Alaska Geologic Survey about how to out, how to archive outcrop models for Alaska because everything's so remote, right? You know, here it's not as remote. We can go drive to it, but still there are reasons why you should archive that, including, you know, just the cost of just going and doing field work. Um, multidisciplinary approaches are extremely important. Okay, they give us a deeper understanding of everything. And uh, we're constantly finding core that turn out to be important in our own core facilities. And the, the clastic outcrops and carbonate outcrops, of course, near Austin are accessible, complex, and extremely interesting. So my goal is to, to archive these outcrops as much as I could. And these are just a list of all kinds of different 3D models that I have from all over the place, okay? And I have a series of them in Texas, Elgin, Bastrop, um, uh, Arlington and San Saba, okay? And I'm trying to find good ways to archive these outcrops. I also have about 80 plus drone videos on YouTube of all kinds of classic outcrops um, all over the uh, Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway, um, just all kinds of different places, okay? And I have 100 plus gigapans on the gigapan website of all different outcrops. So, you know, they're all available out there. I'm trying to find ways to share these things with, with folks. And we even wrote a paper, um, Brian Burnham and, and Claire Bond and myself and Dolores Vanderkoek is here and David Hodgetts, just about why it's important to conserve outcrops, all right? And part of it is just accessibility, you know? Not everybody can get to an outcrop. Not everybody has a helicopter. They can go fly out, you know, to an outcrop in Alaska or Patagonia or whatever, you know? Um, even Texas, you know, there's, there's, there's reasons why you can't access outcrops. And outcrops disappear, okay? This is a classic example of this great outcrop that was across from the Buckies, uh, on the other side of the freeway. And Lord knows we need another gas station across from the Buckies. And so they put one there. And now there you can no longer see this outcrop, which was the only accessible pair sequences of the uppermost Calvert Bluff and Sabine Town. Okay. With abundant, abundant Ophiomorpha and marine traces and fish scales and shark's teeth. That should be an exclamation point because. Um, there are shark's teeth there. So uh, it's really important for our broader understanding of sequence stratigraphy. Um, and it was 11 meters of outcrop, but it was a really important 11 meters of outcrop. And it's not there anymore. So, you know, if, if you can drone it, if you can measure it, ground truth it, other reasons, right? Outcrops collapse, right? There's a lot of outcrops along rivers. Outcrops collapse, right? And they disappear. They get covered. It happens all the time. If it's not, you know, human-induced, it's, it's, you know, weathering. Um, you can take 
models you can take of uh, you know different different researchers models for example um the wave fluvial tidal classification system and if you can ground drown truth uh outcrops and you can also um drone outcrops then you can take these classification systems you can start I don't want to say pigeonholing, but you start classifying different parts of outcrops. And we've done that, um, Dolores and I have done that uh, for some of the outcrops that we gigapanned in, in Alaska. And since we have the measured stratigraphy, we can start to classify the different bits of the stratigraphy. And then we know where they are on the outcrops, especially if you have drone photogrammetry, because it's quantitative. Gigapans are qualitative, but you can drape these different um, you know, these different types of, of depositional systems on the outcrop and see how things are changing. And that should speak to predictability of geometries and internal stratigraphy over distance, especially you have these really laterally continuous outcrops like this. So in this case, you know, there's, there's some fluvial dominated, um, way of modified uh, exposures and those transition to more fluvial with a tidally modified, uh, fluvial dominated to tidal mod tidally modified exposures. And we do this in the book Cliffs. This is on drone photogrammetry of the Kenilworth and Woodside Canyon. Some folks have probably been there. And you know you can just go and drown, ground truth and, and drape these types of classification systems right over the outcrop. And you can drape stratigraphy right over the outcrop on, on digital models. Um, and, and resolution is what you can get. Okay, people always ask me what the resolution is. You know, if you, you can fly far away from the outcrop and get low resolution, but then you can also go in and you can pick and choose what you want higher resolution of on the outcrop. Okay, and and also, you know, just as far as star is concerned, these are all serving as as analogs for subsurface reservoirs, right? Just because they're not in Texas doesn't mean they're not worth it. Okay, and here's a good example of the bug scuffle in the Sacramento Mountains, which is a potential analog for some of the mixed carbonate clastic deposits in um, in the Strawn. And there's beautiful outcrops. Charlie knows all about them, um, and he's here today, Charlie Kieran's and. And they're fantastic. And I think that, 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 that we could leverage some of those great analogs, which are also uh, you know, coeval contemporaneous with the strong outcrops. So that's great. Okay, so to the three studies that I wanna talk about. First one is in the Acme Brick Company quarry in Elgin Butler, Texas, okay? And this study is in a quarry here, right, right there um, near the town of Elgin. And it's in this interval that uh, is the transition from the Simsboro formation of the Wilcox group into the Calvert Bluff formation of the Wilcox group. Okay, and it's uh, it's actually quite important because it's a quarry and it's just a window into this interval that we don't get and not everybody has access to. Okay, so they were very gracious to let us in the in um, in the quarry, thanks to Chris Dennison and folks at the quarry. And it's and the thing about it is everything I show you is pretty much gone because um, it's a quarry, right? And so we flew the drone photogrammetry real quickly and measured the stratigraphy, and that's it. And we ran a field trip there, and it's gone. So there's been a lot of work on Sinsboro, Calvert Bluff. The BEG has done this, this big, great subsurface study back in the 80s. So, I mean, it's, it's not the first time that any of this has been done. And Bill Ambrose has, has done a really nice uh, study on the transition from the Sinsboro uh, from the Simsboro to the Calvert Bluff formation in this great paper in the GCAGS journal, uh, looking at this Letco uh, TOH2AO core that's, that's quite some distance from... Uh, from our, uh, the quarry, but it's still applicable. Okay, there, there's not that much well data very close to the quarry, really good well data. And so we, we need to use what we have um, to try and use uh, for comparative analysis. Okay, um, and in the Simsboro 6 sequence that we've seen in core, we've seen a lot of the Simsboro 6 sequence. So, so uh, uh, Bill broke these sequences, the Sims were up into six sequences and the Calvert Bluff up into five sequences. And we're at the very top of the Sims row and very base of the Calvert Bluff. So when I say Sims row six, I mean the uppermost sequence uh, that Bill identified in the Sims row. And in that sequence, it's heavily bioturbated with lots of mud drapes, mud draped ripples, um, climbing ripples, scours. But, you know, the window to the world is this tiny little, you know, couple of inches and that's it. That's all we have. So how can we like leverage these outcrops? 
outcrops, right? So there are two outcrops. There's this L-stan outcrop, and then there's this tan outcrop, and that's just the names that they have for these outcrops in the quarry. And the L-stan outcrop is the Simsboro, and the tan is, um, is the Calvert Bluff. And they're only nine meters thick, but they're a cool nine meters, okay? And, and that's what's really important. And they have a lot of information to share with us. Um, okay, um, so the Simsboro has these sandy faces, and it's very, very tidal. Okay, and that's what's really cool is it's super complex. There's there's climbing ripples, there's mud drapes on absolutely everything. They're absolutely beautiful outcrops. If they were still there, I'd run another field trip there, but I can't. So, but maybe there's a new outcrop there that I don't know about, um, which would be cool too. And that's always good too. You go drone, and you 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 can actually get a, a you know a, a sort of an even better three D model. Okay. Um, and the muddy facies are really interesting. There's these big mud ships, um, which are very common in tidal systems, mud, mud class breccias. Um, there's some bioturbation, uh, some, some uh, planolites and tychicnus, which is, um, you know, suggests maybe a little bit of marine influence on some of these systems. Um, and when you get up into the Calvert Bluff, there's paleosols and leaf mats. And we had a lot of luck getting some pollen data out of this. Okay. And um, the Calvert Bluff, you know, are, is, are these terrestrial deposits, these continental terrestrial deposits, okay? So, and, and I'm going to show you that in a second. So here are the two outcrops, okay? And so I'm going to show you the Simsboro first, and I'm going to show you the Calvert Bluff. And what's really cool is that um, the Virtual Outcrop Geology Group, which is a collaboration between the Norwegian Research Center in Bergen, Norway, and the University of Aberdeen, allow you to, to for free, and there's a process you go through of just sort of making sure it's a really good model. Um, they let you upload these models and, and they're up there and they're for free. Okay. And so I can just, um, I'm going to go and let's see, how do I escape out of here? Um, whoops. Let's see. How do I escape out of here during the zoom? I swear I hit the escape key. I swear I did. Um, here we go. Um, okay. So that's okay. Let me go back in here. And let me control click. That should work. Okay. There we go. Okay, so it's archived on this website, and you can click on it, and here it is, okay, he says. Okay, there it is, all right. And you can change the quality of the model. Um, this is the model of, of the outcrop belt. It looks very weird because I didn't fly, uh, I didn't fly in a down-looking form because the outcrops were, um, uh, they were tiered, and I didn't have a lot of time to do this. But what's cool is, they're available for free on this outcrop, right? And so the manuscript that we're publishing, we gave a link to this to these different uh, 3D models on, on this website, which is there specifically to curate these models, okay? And you can change the resolution. So as I zoom in, you can change the resolution, right? And you can increase the resolution. It's kind of like Google Earth, right? And so you can go in and you can take a look at at these deposits. These are really heterolithic, kind of strangely behaving channels. That's what Cornell and I have talked about these, and they're they're tidally influenced, the, these tidally influenced heterolithic channels that are preserved in this outcrop belt. Okay. And there's some mud plugs that you can take, you can look at. Um, sorry, it's jumpy, which I'm going to change the resolution on this. And, and so it's there, it's there for you to look at, and it's associated with the manuscript, which is really good, right? So the interpretations are in the manuscript, but the model is there for you to look at, at, at your leisure. And what they have a measuring tool on here, which is cool. So if you wanna know what the thickness of something is, if you're curious, you wanna use it as an analog for a reservoir model or something like that, it tells you that that's 2.69 meters, okay? And they're gonna have some interpretation, um, uh, uh, functionality but it's not there yet okay so this is this is what the um what the the uh l stand outcrop of the sims bro looks like all right and now if i can go back and those outcrops are now bricks that is correct yes they're bricks okay yep so 
<laughs> yep, it's the Acme Brick Company. Okay, that is correct. Okay, and so this this we don't have the we don't have the uh, contact between the Simsboro and the Calvert Bluff, but this is the Calvert Bluff. And what you will notice, I hope right away, is this is not a shadow. This is actually a really organic rich um, mudstone with lots of plant fossils and leaf fossils. There's there's another one right down here. We got a really good palynologic assemblage out of this. This this I, these these I think are organic rich um, Oxbow Lake deposits, and there's all kinds of. Um, uh, IHS, incline heterolithic stratification, point bar deposits here. You can start to see these point bar deposits that are right here, right there. Okay. And, and there are paleosols in this outcrop. So we go from, from something that had um, planolites and tychicness and um, uh, uh, almost no flood, actually no floodplain at all preserved to this um and to across the boundary to something that has paleosols oxbow lakes um you know very terrestrial okay okay and what's nice is then you can export these ortho mosaics from the drone models and you can interpret on them right and and so that's what we did and Everything that you interpret, you can tie to the bigger picture. And I think that's really important. And that's that's the power of having this drone photogrammetry. You know, this is just a figure from the paper, and there's interpretations on everything. Every one of these is tied to some position within that drone photogrammetry. So it, it, it just helps you look at both the small details and the big picture. And within this, we use biostratigraphy through Petrostrat. And the important points are here that it we were able to get an age you know based out of the palynology of mid Phoenician, which was really great for for that particular bit of the stratigraphy you know that that is not preserved that well um, in outcrop and the the palynology also gives us some an idea about depositional environments right so it came up with you know sort of this coastal plain to delta plain environment with fluvial channels and a riparian uh, floodplain wetland so so that was great with some freshwater algal cysts it, it, it turned out to be a really great study. And, and it preserved that outcrop for, you know, uh, for hopefully eternity, okay? Um, to, it's very important to tie this stuff to the subsurface as you can. There was a Saunders um, IE number one well that we can use to directly tie um, the outcrop to the subsurface. It was only uh, eight miles away. And, and the transition in the subsurface from the wireline logs show us that, you know, you go from this, this really blocky wireline log pattern in the Sims rule, which are reflecting these sort of amalgamated channel systems that are, you know, have no floodplain and it's very tidally influenced distal tidal fluvial channels is what they are, fluvial tidal channels, to this more blocky pattern that includes some of these coaly bits that are sitting up in the Calvert Bluff. And you can see that right in the quarry, all right? And it's reflected in the subsurface. And 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 Bill had already said, using a, a core, the Letco core, which is um, up in Leon County, that he saw in the core a transition from, um, you know, a more retrogradational cycle to a more progradational cycle across this Simsboro Calvert Bluff contact. And that is evident right in the outcrop bill. OK, um, going from that those tidal systems to the more uh, coastal plainy um, fluvial distributive systems without as much tidal input and paleosols. Um, and and Bill mapped this these two sequences out uh, again. This is this is the study area that in the quarry and this is the Bill's large study area. But he did a, a fantastic job. And one of the things that, you know, we've really noticed that you go from more of a uh, dis, these these south and south east, southeast trending belts that bifurcate southward in more of a distributary pattern in the Simsboro, and then you go up into the Calvert Bluff, and everything is a bit more like a tributary pattern. Okay, yes. That. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So analogs. Um, 
you know, if you've been to the book class, uh, the Neslin Formation, we think, is a great analog. I had a really nice conversation with Cornell Olario about this. I've been to Floyd Canyon. We take students to Floyd Canyon on field camp uh, to look at these, uh, these heterolithic channels of the Neslin Formation that sit on top of the Sago. Um, and they're a really good analog, I think. They're tidal, they have a bioturbation, they have mud drapes in them. Um, it, they're, they're a very good analog. And there's, there's also some examples of them in East Canyon. I had a student, Ashley Murphy, work on those. And I think they're a really nice analog. There's really no floodplain preserved anywhere within these channel systems. And they're kind of amalgamated. There's lots of scouring. It's a very good, good analog. Um, having worked in Alaska a lot, I think for something like the, the Calvert Bluff, I think the Prince Creek Formation is a really good analog. I know it's far away. I know it's in Alaska. But, you know, there's coals and paleosols and lots of logs and lots of leaf matter and, and paleosols. I'm sorry, and levees and splays. And then there are these channels. There's large channels and small channels with lots of lateral accretion surfaces, but it's very, you know, coastal plain uh, related and not, not really, you know, more of this very distal tidal channels. And there's no bioturbation, no marine bioturbation in these. Okay, so second study that I'm gonna talk about. Now I'm gonna jump, okay, to the outcrops in Bastrop, Texas, okay? And these, are just fantastic because you can drive there. You know, there's people who are here from Bastrop right now who came to see this talk, right? And it's great. It's, I'm so happy about that because you can drive there and you can take students there and you can take industry there, you know, as long as you get the permissions from all the landowners, et cetera. But I mean, it's there for you to drive around, and take a look at it. And the more we know about it, the, the better off we are. So, um, you know, I, I'm working, you know, I'm piggybacking off work of others, right? And, um, you know, there's a field guide, a GSA field guide uh, by Yancey Adele, and I think they really did a good job. They, they nailed a lot of things about these outcrop belts. They, they noticed that they weren't fluvial, that they were probably more deltaic. And then Chris Dennison, who is here, and Thomas Demchuk, they took it another step further, and they really analyzed some of these outcrops, and they did some biostratigraphy on these outcrops and described them and described them as, as deltaic and, and, and marine and not really fluvial. Um, but uh, that be and 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 they found um, a pectidinium uh, and a, pect a pectidinium spike in the outcrop in this dark band that sits below the Carrizo and within or above the um, within or above the Sabine Town. Okay, and and so now we're up here in the Sabine Town to Carrizo transition. So we were sitting down here in the Simsboro Calvert Bluff Formation transition. And now we've moved up here to another important Texas uh, Wilcox outcrop in the Sabine Town in the Carrizo, okay? Yeah, so, so the Epectodinium is a marker dinocyst for the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum transition, okay? So it's very, very important and, and and now there's some argument about whether there's more than one apectidinium spike during the PETM, but it tends to be a marker for the PETM, uh, Paleocene Thermal Maximum. And my next slide is just about that, you know, that, that during the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, we had a global warming event, right? And, and there's a negative isotope excursion in carbon-13, okay? And so, um, so, and, and this is recorded in both po uh, biostratigraphy and in isotopes, okay? But it's also, so, so it, it can all, since it's one of the uh, more recent and major hyperthermal events, warming events in earth history, it can be used as a, a potential, you know, we can go look at outcrops, we can go look at the rock record and we can use it as a potential for what might happen as if, if for anthropogenic, anthropogenic climate change and current warming of the earth, right? And how does that affect river discharge networks, warming of the earth, right? Um, erosion, sedimentation, um, coastline, coastline morphology. What if you're sending a bunch of, of, of sediment to the coast because you're, you're eroding more sediment off the interior, right? And so, so we can use these ancient uh, analogs 
as, as analogs for the modern. And this has been done before in places like the Peons Creek Basin and the Bighorn Basin, where the PIT, PETM is identified by this negative carbon isotope excursion. And this is just a paper by Brady Foreman. You know, and it's an increase of global temperature, you know, over as little as 4,000 years, 2,000 uh, years, including the recovery phase and, and with this, this big sediment influx. So that, that being said, this, this marker, if, if the apectodinium is in the outcrops in Bastrop and the PETM is there, you know, can we use other methodologies to try and understand that interval better and, and nail down the PETM? And I've, we've done this, um, Glenn Sharman and I and other folks have worked in the, the Hanna Basin of Wyoming, and we've done this uh, uh, using uh, palynology and uh, also uh, carbon isotopes and uh, and geochemistry within the PETM in the Hanna Basin. And I'm not going to show you that today, but Glenn is also, uh, Glenn and I have also worked on the PETM uh, in Texas in the subsurface in Anderson County, which I will talk about. So series of outcrops in Bastrop, Texas. We have high resolution photo panoramas, gigapan panoramas, as well as 3D models of the outcrops. Okay. And there's a series of outcrops and I will show you. We also, uh, Catherine Garcia, whose master's this is, um, also went out and collected a lot of samples for palynology and isotopes across this apectodinium spike in as many outcrops as we could in, in, um, in Bastrop. Okay, um, I'm gonna come out here. Okay. I'm going to remote desktop into my desktop, which I hope will work. Okay. And so we, we have a drone model of the outcrop with the apectodinium spike in it. And one of the things that I think is really important, and the reason why I want Catherine to come out here, is we wanted to collect at high resolution through the Sabine Town below the apectodinium spike through the apectodinium spike, and then up into the Carrizo, which sits atop of the, the dark band here. And the idea was, one, to try and see if we could identify a negative carbon isotope excursion in the outcrop. And then also, you know, think about whether or not this Carrizo here is the sedimentary response potentially to this warming event of the PETM. Okay, and just think about it. And because we've we've thought about it before, <laughs> and I'll show you that that bit of information in a minute. But what's really cool about the drone photogrammetry in this particular outcrop belt is I don't know if you can see this, but this is a big sort of semicircular outcrop belt, and you can never see this whole outcrop at one time. You actually have to, um, you know, Chris Dennison has used a machete to get us back and get a path through the woods to get back to this outcrop belt. So the only way you would ever see this whole outcrop together is using drone photogrammetry. There's really no other way. And, and, you, and you can't even see up, up high in these outcrops. So if um, this wasn't so jumpy, but what I think you can see is if you look very carefully here is that the, the Carrizo is built um, of these large scale trough cross stratified bar forms. Okay, so as you look at the drone photogrammetry, and, and I, I don't have interpreted um, drone photogrammetry for you now, that's Catherine's job as, as the master student on this project, but she can go in here and start interpreting on these 3D models in areas that you can't even really see because it's covered by trees and you can't get up to that. Whereas down in the lower part here, um, before you get up to the Carrizo, this is all heterolithic, heterolithic flaser, wavy, lenticular bedded sandstones and, and siltstones. Okay, with a little bit of, of ripple laminated sandstone below the boundary. Okay, I'm going to come out of there. Go back into my talk, which is where I'll disappear. Hmm. Chuck? Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. Sorry. Sorry, that is correct. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Voting meeting controls.
All right. Um, so uh, the Sabine Town, which sits below the Carrizo, is full of wavy lenticular beds, and it's definitely, it's all bioturbated. Okay, and so it's marine. There's there's no doubt about it. And Chris Dennison and others have said that before that it's a, like a delta front deposit, distal delta front to pro delta deposit with a high abundance, low diversity trace fossil assemblage. And so Catherine is collected through this interval. Okay, and what you're seeing here are all the available samples that we have, and the samples that we ran as sort of a test run to see if we could nail down this carbon isotope excursion. And what you're seeing are a series of of 26, negative 26.9 carbon isotope values, okay, from bulk carbon that we ran, okay, and everything in the Sabine Town that we ran comes up in the 26s, 25s, and down into the 24s, okay. <clears throat> and this is the little bit of interval that is within the uh, dark band which hit the epectodinium spike. And what I think you can see, I hope you can see, is that we finally got some values right where the epectodinium spike is in the negative 27s. That's not that high, but it's definitely, it's definitely a spike from 25 to 27 and back to 25.8. And we have a few other, so we're gonna run more uh, more isotopes for this interval to try and nail this down. But we think that the isotopes actually, fortunately, you know, concur with the epectodinium spike that this is actually the isotope excursion in this outcrop, which is fantastic. You know, other people have tried to do this and it just hasn't worked really well. And we're using, um, we're using um, some folks who have done this a, a lot for the PETM, especially in Spain. And so it worked really well. Okay, and so this is the Copperus Creek outcrop belt, and this is the trend that you can see. Okay, so this looks like an excursion. And we talked to the folks who ran our isotopes, and they agree this looks like a, an isotope excursion. Okay, um, there's another outcrop belt called Red Bluffs that I'm not really going to talk about. And the reason I'm not going to talk about it is that it cuts down and it removes that um, dark band. Okay, the dark band is not exposed at this area. And um, Chris Dennison noticed that from the drone photogrammetry. Um, and so folks have tried to run isotopes across this and didn't have much success. And the problem is that the, the dark band, which contains the pectidinium, is not exposed there. Okay. There's an outcrop along the golf course. So that was Copperus Creek, Red Bluff, and now the golf course. This golf course outcrop is very complicated because there's an incision here. And that incision cuts down and we think cuts through the dark band and into the Sabine Town. There's Sabine Town sitting right here. It comes down, cuts down, and then it's filled with this series of channel fills and organic rich silt stones. Um, so we ran isotopes in there thinking maybe if we found the excursion, it might run, if this is younger and filled after the PTM, that that excursion might run into this. But these are the values that we got, which are all in the 25s and 26s. Okay. And, you know, we just kind of had to run a smattering to catch every kind of facies in here and see what we got. So we really didn't seem like we got an isotope excursion in there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I don't think that the, the folks can hear the questions. So maybe, maybe could we hold that just to the end so that we can repeat the question? Okay. Um, and so, uh, so, so, so then we're going to go to Mamalu Drive. Okay, and Mamalo Drive is a really interesting outcrop. Sorry. Um, escape out of there and go back to here. And this is Mamalu Drive. And it has on the very edge of it, very down here at the base, um, Chris has identified the uh, the dark band behind these trees here and this incision surface off to the right with the Carrizo sitting on top of it. And it has a, it has a nice relatively fine grained interval in the Carrizo, which sits up here. Okay. <clears throat> Along with um, really beautiful large scale trough cross stratification, which you can see over here and abundant ophiomorpha. So as we zoom in here, sorry about that, it's a little jumpy, but there's really nice large scale trough cross stratification with really large, long uh, uh, ophiomorpha in the section. So it's not fluvial, it's definitely marine, okay? 
There's some sort of really interesting channel feature or let with uh, accretion surfaces up here that, that Catherine's gonna work on. And then there's some finer grain material. So what's, what's nice about this is there was enough fine grain material that we could run isotopes on this section, okay? So the PETM, so the question, there's a question here about where the PETM is. The PETM is below this entire stratigraphy, okay? So we're above the PETM in this stratigraphy, okay? Um, large Ophiomorpha, long Ophiomorpha, and there's also um, a glossophongitis surface that sits at the base of the carrizo, which I would potentially call a tritolites ichnophases. And all that that means is that whatever waters that came up over the top of this lignite were marine, okay? And these are marine, marine bioturbation on top of that, okay? So this is a weird smattering of isotope data, but this is the best way to display it. And that is that we've run isotopes from the base, which, the, the, the PETM should be right down here, okay? And there's only a little spot where Chris Dennison thinks that the, um, that the dark band is exposed. And then it's cut out with this sort of channel slash valley fill, whatever you want to call it, this incision down here. And then sitting on top of it is all this carrizo. And so we ran the numbers through the carrizo and there, there's some kind of high numbers, but they're in the 26s and 25s. Uh, but we have a lot more samples that we can run, and so we're, we're, we're in the process of doing that, okay? We're also running PALI for all of this. Um, the the, the, the uh, folks at Petrostrat didn't have uh, any samples from up in this area, and so they don't have PALI from the Criso, so we don't have a good idea of the age of that. And so they're running PALI. And so this is, the, this is sort of the outcrop composite log. If I took all of those three outcrops, put them all together and built a, a composite log for that. And that's what it would look like, okay? All right, so a spike right during, right at the, um, at the apect pectodinium acme, and then this sort of fluctuating uh, isotope, ex you know, isotopes above that. Okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna take you to the subsurface of Anderson County, and there's a reason for this, and that is that, we know from previous work on core that we have the Carrizo in Anderson County. And we actually have quite a bit of core through the Carrizo in Anderson County because it is a, um, it's a reservoir out there, all right? I um, mean, it's it, the, the core that we have is oil stained, okay? Um, and and, um, and uh, Charmin et al, uh, we have a paper, Glenn Sharman, Jake Cavalt, myself, and other people have a paper that's, that's in, pre, in preprint right now. It's, it's accepted with revisions um, in Paleo Cubed about this, some of this subsurface in, in, um, in Anderson County. So it's 250 kilometers away, all right? So that's a long way, but we don't have any really good subsurface. You don't have any core in Bastrop. If anybody knows about some core that crosses this interval in Bastrop, we want to know about it so that we can run some analyses. Same analyses are running an outcrop on core. Okay. Um, so, so Catherine's study is piggybacking. It's an expansion off of this study that we did when Glenn Sharman was here as a postdoc at QCL. Um, and we, I always wondered, could we somehow try to connect this with the, you know, if we have the Carrizo and Calvert Bluff transition. Uh, well, so one thing I should say is that. I don't think that the Sabine Town, that flooding surface that you see in the um, in the outcrops in Bastrop, that Sabine Town flooding surface might not make it all the way up to Anderson County. So the the Carrizo probably sits directly on the Calvert Bluff there. That doesn't mean the PETM does not exist within the Calvert Bluff or the Carrizo. We just don't know. Okay. So so Glenn Sharman, this is from our manuscript with Glenn, and he ran isotopes um, from uh, one of the cores that we have, the Burrow JT1 core, um, and from the base of the core through the top of the core, and he got a negative isotope excursion in that core with the idea that this could be the PTM. Okay, and this is should be published very shortly. He also found another series of cores um, in Leon County, not Anderson County, Leon County, um, and made a composite core out of all these cores because none of them was complete, but then was also able to, you see these okay cores right here? He was able to develop a, a 
isotope curve through those cores and got an isotope excursion. So I thought, hey, we've got a whole bunch more core. Let's see if we can really flesh this out a little bit more with additional core. So this is the Slocum field in Anderson County that, that, um, that uh, Catherine is working on. So here's sort of just the, the, the bulk data, right? Right here in Anderson County. Um, so here are the available logs from Anderson County. Here are the logs that have the top Carrizo and top Calvert Bluff, which is what we really are interested in. We want that Carrizo to Calvert Bluff transition. Again, reminder that there's no Sabine town here. Um, and then there, we had a whole bunch of core available. So we selected specific core that were kind of the best core, the longest core, the best preserved core, and close to some of the wireline log data. So we could, or if they had, of course, associated wireline data, that was great. Um, um, so uh, Catherine just gave me these yesterday. She's working on these correlations, but this is this is top Carrizo and this top Calvert Bluff. Um, and I know the scales are a little weird here, but regardless, and what you what I hope that you can see is the Carrizo is a nice big thick sand that sits on top of this Calvert Bluff directly, and it kind of thickens and thins um, across her study area, right? Which is very interesting. Uh, you know, is is the base of the Calvert Bluff incisional here? Sometimes there's finer grain. I'm sorry, the Carrizo incisional. Sometimes there's finer grain material associated with it. Sometimes it's coarser grain, and we see that in the outcrops. Some outcrops are real coarse grain with no fine grain material, and sometimes you have these interbedded, um, even uh, uh, marine bits of the system. Now, in in this area, the Calvert Bluff seems to be predominantly fluvial, and there is not as much marine influence. We're we're further sort of up dip in the system and it's not as marine but there are some places where there seems to be a little bit of interfingering in marine and and fluvial systems um, distal fluvial systems um, this is just a strike section again to just show you that that the the Carrizo thickens and thins and we kind of run out of data right here at the Anderson County border so that's unfortunate but that's what we have but it's still really worthwhile okay so I'm going to look at the Burrow JT1 well, and this is the well that Glenn and I used in, in our study. Okay. So, but we re-ran, we ran, we re-ran isotopes just to sort of cross-check that. Okay. And these are the values that we got. Um, we definitely got, we got some 26s down here in what we, Glenn and I identified as the Calvert Bluff to Carrizo transition in this in this in this well in this core and then we got these negative isotopes that go all the way up to 28 which appear like an excursion and then back down to 26 and then back up to 27 26. again we have a lot more data and we're going to run that data to try and get a higher resolution view of this but it seems like we have an excursion within the carrizo here in um here in anderson county okay we also did the same thing, sorry, in uh, JT1A well, which is sitting right here. And we know that we are only, we only have the Carrizo in this well, okay? We only have the Carrizo in this well. And we had this negative excursion here and back to somewhat of a background right here, okay? And then we ran it in one more well, um, the Thompson Orin, which goes up into the overlying Reclaw formation, which is a marine flooding event. And, and um, we, had a, we had quite a bit of Reclaw in this and another well, which we're still waiting for the isotope data. And we got really high negative values within the Carrizo in, in this well, okay? Now, the problem is that, so that seems pretty cool, right? Okay, the problem is that when we ran the biostratigraphy on all of these wells, we got absolutely nothing that came out as, um, as Paleocene. Everything came out as Eocene. In fact, all of the palynology we have so far has come out as early, or well, to, as early to late Yapresian. Okay, we got nothing Paleocene in this, in this core which is a little bit confusing to us and we're going to run more but but what so 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 we get a late Yapresian age and the dinoflagellates suggest an early Yapresian age of 54 to 56 million years in the NP10 so i mean my my final slide here about all this is that 
So, you know, even, even though we thought we have the PTM in, in, the, in, the, in the paper that, that Glenn and I and Jake are publishing, the palynology is, is telling us right now that, that maybe, maybe the carrizo that we have in these cores is actually younger and that we're actually up in maybe this ETM2, um, which is, so if we're up here in the, the early to late Yaprisian, Maybe we haven't actually picked up the PETM. Maybe we're picking up one of these other hyperthermals that are younger. Okay. And again, you know, this is an ongoing study. Um, we're going to run a lot more samples, but this is our conundrum right now that we're that we're in. And so can we tie the outcrop to the to the uh, subsurface using this methodology? Well, it's really helped us know where we are age-wise, right? And we have found uh, negative isotope excursions. It's just where are we within those, within age-wise, within that stratigraphy, and which excursions are we picking up? The apectodinium was really, really, really positive on the outcrop, but we're not getting those apectodinium uh, in in these in the subsurface here. Okay, so so my takeaway points here are that you know. The Wilcox remains important for many reasons. And doing these outcrop to subsurface, the outcrops are really important. You get so much data, you get so much idea about the lateral connectivity, um, the lateral facies relationships, lateral um, straddle architecture, stacking pattern. You build on the sequence stratigraphic interpretations you get from the core, okay? Um, we need to re-examine them. We need to use as many new techniques as we can, um, and especially multidisciplinary approaches. Okay, drone photogrammetry is really important. It's important so that folks who don't have access to these outcrops and outcrops that are disappearing, that we can we can keep them for, for posterity and additional analyses. Um, and it's very important to archive these things. And and we're constantly finding new core and uh, and that these outcrops are really accessible and you can use them as teaching tools. Uh, especially when you have a lot of this multidisciplinary uh, information. So work in progress, stay tuned. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. We, I think we have 10 minutes for, for anyone that can have questions, even online. I think at some point we have like 40 people connecting, if I can see. Any, any questions from the... Maybe you can read the questions from the chat uh, if there are any. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, right Sue, now. let me just give you this so that people can hear. Uh, so Pete, that's great. You know what we covet doing with your models. We want to flow them, put flow through them. You think what do, what kind of workflow could we make to? I mean, it's a nice scale to take what Highland Nee's been doing in, uh, in yeah. you know meter scale box and conceptualize it. We could model it. We could do things. I'm, lo could I'm looking around the room for a tip because we, we did this with Emily Beckham and one of the right more right? than and, and yeah more we need this complexity because Emily Emily's delta was so ideal it had yeah. done a, didn't have this heterogeneity and the and the and the fluids just ran out of it. But if we get this, right. if did. we get this heterogeneity <laughs> in it, um, the more fun things will happen. So uh, so can we convert these? Can we convert your images to? Uh, proxy models in some way how would what would we do yes yeah, so i i mean my answer is i want any and all of these models to be used as much as possible because if they're just sitting on my desktop they're not doing anybody any good do, except do, me do so you have any um porosity permeability uh res data associated with the models uh -huh. other than what emily collected for the lloyd not really. And there, there's actually a reason for that. And that is most of the time when I ask whether or not people want me to collect for porosity permeability on these outcrops, they say, no, we're going to plug in values. We're going to use your model, but then we're going to plug in our values from our reservoir. But because of, that, because of compaction. Yeah, exactly. And so because they're different, right? And But that doesn't mean that we couldn't go to any of these outcrops and get the data that you need. And since these, since especially these 3D models, they're quantitative, right? So then you can just, you know exactly, you can put them in the, the exact right spot on in the stratigraphy and you can get heterogeneity at whatever level you're interested in, the larger scale, small scale. You know, we, we have tidally modified delta models. We've got fluvial. No, we, we have a permeometer in house that we could, I mean, we could take some samples, bring them back and 
measure. Yeah, that's true. Or else it, yeah. Ourselves. I, mean, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. The translation file. Yeah, so if it's both, but we haven't, so I think you know, how to do that translation. Yeah, the cool. Yeah, cool. That should raise the bar a lot. Yeah, because I know I know you really need to flow some of these, you know, models. Yeah, you know. I'd be happy to do that. Any other question? What is the most probable? Uh, this is from uh, uh, Beverly D. Arnett. What is the most probable amount of time that is missing, if anything, between the Simsboro and Calvert Bluff in the Acme Quarry? Ooh, is Chris still here? He is. Do you remember if the, uh, I'm asking Chris Dennison because uh, he and Thomas Demchuk ran the Biostrat, and he may not know, but I don't remember if there was much of an identifiable age difference between the 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 bio the suite the pal palynological assemblage between the Simsboro and Calvert Bluff. Do you remember? Yeah, I think you're right, Pete. The, there's not enough resolution to to really distinguish one from the other in terms of ages. But um, yeah, it, it's an interesting problem because you're going from you know as you talked about a, a this tidal channel system into a coastal plain system. So there's got to be some time involved in that changeover boundary from one to another and and if it's you know if it's a sequence boundary or something like that there would be time potentially time missing in there but we don't actually we didn't we weren't able to get at that actual contact in the quarry so we were limited to where they were very generous but we were limited to where we could work in the quarry so great question though uh, bill you had some comments or questions Sort of an internal database question. Um, what about the condition of the cores? I know the Letco core is so unconsolidated that any attempt to extract permeability values from that would be futile. Yeah. But uh, what about the other cores that you guys have seen? You think they're in a little better shape? They're in good shape, but they're not very consolidated. That's the problem, right? So, I mean, these these Anderson County cores are between three hundred and fifty and 700 feet in depth so that doesn't really yeah, give us much yeah i, I just i wanted to make also a, a a comment and i think pete touched on it um that you know we we're talking about these um specific aspects of applicability you know in in, in terms of running models and things like that but the beauty of this project i think is that um in terms of implications it goes into that but it also goes into the broader question of, you know, what the, what was the PETM regionally uh, in, in the Gulf Coast? And that's one of the reasons why when we started to work, especially on the uh, isotopic data in, in Bastrop, I was thinking about our colleagues in Geneva uh, and, and Thierry also, because I, I knew that they were running similar, uh, similar analysis in offshore Gulf of Mexico with one of the few wells that uh, the core was available for academics, and I think they're going to be publishing soon, soon, soon mm -hmm. you know. So, so the objective then would be to try to compare and tie the work that Catherine and Pete have been doing there with the offshore component, because I think that has been an outstanding question in our community for many decades. Uh, you know, what's the correlation? What's the what's the equivalence? Uh, yeah, and I, if I can just speak to that really quick, and that that's something I didn't really stress that much, but. Um, you know, there there are these databases out there, and Petrostrad has one of them, and probably Ellington might have another one, other folks that we use, you know, for the, you know, for the Biostrat offshore. And so the more onshore information that we can get, the more we understand how, you know, sequence stratigraphically things are related across this fault zone. Things are related in time. Can we use the palynologic assemblage to say, oh, this is a this is a huge bypass surface? right? That's what people want to know, right? Where is the sand going? Is it going somewhere at this point or is it hanging around, right? And so the, the Biostrat can really help you with that. Okay. Uh, hi, Peter. Maria Oliver here. Uh, great presentation. Beautiful. Just wanted to know if you have run any other use of any other uh, discipline, Biostrat discipline, like 
uh, nanoplankton for them besides, uh, or in addition to Pali. Mm. Um, Chris and I were talking about the ability to do that. Um, and actually, uh, Theory and Sebastian and I had another conversation about whether or not we could use nanofossils. The, you know, the, the, I don't, I'm not a really, I'm not a specialist in that, but I would say that this is very, very proximal shelf. Right? Well, I just got a recent uh, study uh, for UCN samples. Well, this is a younger section, it's in the Yewa. And tidal, very marginal marine, and it's a beautiful, beautiful recovery for nano. That was really surprising. Actually, since you have the most complete uh, sun uh, with markers there. So I'm just saying that I was surprised too because foreign is my discipline. Okay, I wasn't expecting to recover. Uh -huh. This is Lorena here. Maybe we yes. can do some samples and you can help us figure it out. Yeah, because again, I this wasn't expecting any nanos in this section. Very shallow water, okay? And the recovery of nano was yes, shocking, hold, hold. okay? Yes, yeah. we I mean, can do that. Chris has, a, Chris has looked at some of this, yes. Well, for a, on the on the palynology slides, um, if there were any foraminifera, we would see the inner linings. Now, these are these are micro forearms as opposed to the ones that you would be looking at, the bigger ones. Yeah, um, yeah, but... And, and in all of the slides <laughs> that I've looked at so far, I haven't seen a single micro forearm lining. Yeah. So argues that, you know, the forearms are either you know, extraordinarily rare or just not present. Yeah, but this is the interesting part. In my samples, I didn't analyze the foreign. There's no foreign at all, just shell fragments, okay? But the nano, record, the nano recovery was amazing. So it's something to consider, okay? Okay. Yeah, we, you know, again, it's probably um, ecologically, it's way too shallow water to have the nanofossils present. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, again. No, no, we can, we can, we can try. I mean, there is no harm in trying to to see if we have recovery of nano and 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 try with that. So that I think that's an excellent point. Yeah. Well, keep in mind that you know, people have looked at this stuff for decades. Mm -hmm. Well, but we haven't found the PT, PTM in onshore Texas for decades. Well, I, I think right? this so, question is about modeling, and I think that anything that we can use with respect to these outcrops. And to model anything is a good idea. I hope that answers that question. Okay, did, did so you... I think we're hitting on on uh, ten a.m. So we can keep the conversation here with people in the in the in the in the room. But people who are connected, maybe we. And I know there are some other meetings around, so we can yep. just have a conversation among ourselves here. Well, thank, thank you, you very everybody. Much. Thank you, Peter. This yeah. was great. Thank you. you.